Pod. Pod. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the 22 Grand Pod podcast. In this episode, we're talking to Ross Millard of the Future Heads. The Future Heads were a band that really took the naughty scene by storm, with a single in the top 10 and a debut album going gold. Ross was able to join me from his home in the Northeast to talk about his time in the Future Heads with a healthy dose of football chat thrown in. How's it going, mate? I find the lockdown and all that. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's difficult in many ways, isn't it? But I think everyone's just sort of trying to crack on and make the best of it, aren't they? Like, you know, I think as long as we can still get outside and sort of do a little bit of exercise and stuff, then you can kind of, you can forget about it for a, for a little while every every now and then, can't you? How yeah, you? yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's been all right, yeah. Um, I had a baby quite recently, so I've gone from going to work and getting away from it to uh, being fully involved now. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's a different challenge altogether, that, like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> got a lot of lot of friends who who are sort of in the position of homeschooling their kids or or with babies and stuff and it's it, it, man i don't know how you're doing it to be honest <laughs> are you uh you up in sunderland then i'm in uh, newcastle mate yeah so i've, I've lived in oh, right. newcastle for for nearly 20 years now um, oh, right, i'm from yeah. i'm from sunderland yeah, um, yeah. and all, all the other lads are still still across there uh, okay it's, so close, you know, to stones throw, really. Yeah, yeah. You, you, like, you all big Sunderland fans, you are. Well, no, when, when, well, we're not actually. I'm, I'm uh, right because my, but a couple of the lads really are. Um, okay, but I'm a, I'm a United fan myself. Ah, um, uh, fair enough. Um, <laughs> my dad's from Astley, actually, so not not too not too far from you. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, I'm quite new to the area, but like getting a, getting my head around it now. <laughs> Oh right, yeah. I mean, I, I love the northwest. Like, I have to say, we sort of got a lot of family there, so we're there a lot. Like, but um, yeah, no, a, co- a couple of the lads really are, and I, and I, I do still go along and watch Sunderland quite a lot as well. Like, you know, it's sort of if it's possible to have a second team, then they're definitely that at least. Like, you know, yeah, because I saw you've played, you've played there a couple of times, haven't you? Like when they got promoted and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, over the years, they've asked us to do a few bits and bobs, and they used to run out to. Run out the tunnel to begin with the twist for a little uh, while there, right. which was cool. which was really nice, man. You know, it's cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Was that when um, Roy Keane was in charge when they got promoted? Yeah, it was sort of around that time, and then just 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 afterwards, sort of thing. But you know, I mean, for about five, six, seven years in a row, they were sort of fourth from bottom every season, more or less. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, <laughs> it was a long time coming the uh the relegations like yeah i was gonna say have you watched any of the um sunderland till i die stuff oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> i mean uh <laughs> it, it, it's just such a shame that there, there wasn't a doc made when they were actually sort of doing all right for it for a while in the in the prem you know like yeah when yeah peter reed was in in charge or something like that because i think that would have been a, a different kettle of fish but I, I i i get the impression that a lot of people who've watched it They've, they've they've grown a fondness for Sunderland out of it, like you know. So yeah, I've heard they've got like like a new American following because of it or something. I don't know how true yeah. that. That sounds pretty. Yeah, because the lads who made the documentary, they produce like um, James Corden's show in the states and stuff, you know. So I think. Oh, they're, right. they're, they're, I think Netflix have have put it on in America and all over the world, sort of thing, you know. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, I've heard they're um, mm-hmm. they're Sunderland fans, the guys behind it. Yeah, oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, Football yeah. Seventy Three, the company's called. Yeah, ah, okay, oh, interesting. Um, well, Burnt their bridges now, mind. I don't think they'll get to do a third scene <laughs> by the sounds of it. Anyway, like, you know, what are they fuming? The owners, <laughs> do you think? I, I think so. I think this, the Methan and Stuart Donald. I think they feel like they've been made to look foolish a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right, we, yeah. you know, which they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I just think that. I, I, I can't see it happening again by the sounds of it. Like, <laughs> yeah. It gives an idea of how he went from starting a band to getting a record deal. Yeah, so we, we started the Future Heads in sort of autumn of the year 2000. Right. And um, basically we were, we were all young kids that had grown up going to this 
detached youth project in Sunderland City Centre that was sort of run, run by a youth worker called Dave Murray. And the idea behind it was on a Saturday morning, kids from all over the city could come to this sort of um, building that had some rehearsal rooms in it. And the idea would be that that kids would sort of collaborate and, and play covers together and make friends. And it was a bit of a youth club sort of oriented around music. And, and that's where we all met because we were all from different parts of the city and we all like totally different music, but because we were all dead, dead into our music, I think that that's what sort of drew us together. You know, I think the first we met Barry and he was really into Nick Drake and that album Five Leaves okay. Left and all that stuff. And I, I think I lent him a pavement album in exchange for it. And that was a little bit of like mutual respect in the beginning, you know, like uh, how these things sometimes go. Yeah. And it, and it all just sort of came out of that really, you know, I think a lot of the other kids went off to get full-time jobs or go to university or whatever. And, and we were the ones that were left behind in Sunderland. And I think we all just thought, okay, then let's, let's form our own band. Yeah. And we started rehearsing in um, Barry and Dave's, mum's garage basically in the beginning it was a it was a daft project more than a band really you know i think the idea was that we'd try and have it so that every gig would be different um so the first sort of four gigs that we did four or five gigs first one was just f four songs seven minutes it's basically all the material we had right but the but the second one we um we just sang the songs to a pre-recorded backing track of the music in a kind of like stupid mim mimicking like a boy band basically with like stool right. stools and stuff yeah um, <laughs> and then the third one we'd sort of painted our faces silver and dressed up like sort of really crap robots right. sort of <laughs> fourth one i think we we all sort of played different instruments like swapped instruments around and things so it was meant to just be a a bit of fun in the beginning that wasn't really serious and yeah. especially since peter already had field music on the go and we were already in a, few, a handful of other different bands ourselves and th and the scene in the northeast at the time was quite small you know so it was the same faces coming to more or less every gig yeah. even though it was a, a a decent local scene in terms of the quality of the bands and things like that um but after about you know six months of, of, of treating it like that and, and not really taking it too seriously. The idea of playing gigs outside of town started to creep in. Um, we played the King Tuts in Glasgow. Oh, yeah. and, and a couple of people who'd been to see us a few times had started to sort of ask us if we were interested in management and, and things like that. Oh, okay. And, and, and we weren't at the time, you know, because there was no sort of precedent in the Northeast for like any bands going off and signing a record deal and stuff you know the, yeah. most, the most interesting thing that was happening up here at the time was bands actually releasing their own music or there was a, a very small independent label called slamped which okay. we really respected and admired and i think if anything we dreamt that maybe one day they might release our music right. but, um you know how these things go slowly but surely yeah um, it, 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 it just got out of hand and there was a, a, one guy in particular that had been to see us a few times and afterwards he'd always say, you know, I, I, I'm looking to get into music management. I really like you. Yeah. Can we give it a try? And after a few times of saying no, we thought, oh, well, go on then. Like, let's, let's see what difference it makes. And that's when uh, we started sort of playing much more further afield around the country, doing gigs in London, getting our first introduction to the sort of music industry, if you like. Yeah. He was backed by two other, two other guys, um, a big life management who was still managed by now. Um, and, and they were, that's a big management company as far as the music industry is concerned, you know, and oh, okay. looked after the, the Verve and Badly Drawn Boy and right. you know, some, some big names at the time. Um, yeah, yeah. And so it started to feel quite serious. Um, okay, what did, year was that, sorry? And so this is about 2002, basically, right, okay, it's yeah. sort of early, early 2002. And we started um, doing some demos with Andy Gill from the Gang of Four because he was a producer that, that Big Life all, also managed, um, right. which felt like a, a match made in heaven for us at the time because that was a band that we really, really admired, you know. But, okay. but really from there, we got offered a, a tour of, of Europe of like... Um, 
squat clubs and youth centres and like on that like DIY circuit, you know, where it, all the gigs had been booked by this other band from Newcastle who we were going going away with, and they'd basically just invited us to jump in the van with them and go on this this two week tour. All right, yes. But that was the the sort of straw that broke the camel's back for for Pete Brewis. Really, that that was a a bridge too far for him. He didn't really feel like he could commit to starting and to go out on two week tours. And uh, okay. I, th- I think he knew that it was sort of starting to get a little bit more serious and yeah. he or- already had his own thing going as well. So that's when we got uh, Dave Hyde, Barry's younger brother in on drums. And, and that's, that's the way it stayed from there on out really. So obviously the rest of you guys were like, we're loving it kind of thing. Oh yeah. I mean, even even at that time, sort of 2002, when we'd been going for a couple of years, I still think we all thought, oh, well, this is a really great thing to have going on in the background when you've yeah. got like a, a, a serious proper job or, you know, I was at university in Newcastle um, with still a year to go at that point. But by the time I, gra- I graduated in summer 2003 and I remember sort of graduating and then getting on a train to London to go and play the bar fly, Right. on the same day and I think we'd, we'd already signed a deal with with 679 by that by that point you know to, to start yeah. making the album properly um, which, which, which was great and very exciting but it very quickly becomes just the, the norm you know you sort of hear yeah. some great news and because you're going to hear some again the next day you sort <laughs> of you start taking it for granted very quickly man you know yeah yeah and I guess like you had a bit of a unique sound with like your harmonies and stuff. Was that mm. like what inspired that? And did you did you work quite hard on them to get to get it good? I think we just nobody really wanted to be the the main singer in the beginning, oh, right, okay. and so I think we just shared the vocals out between us. I mean, it sort of evolved a little bit more over the years to to sort of Barry being the one who sings more of the songs than anyone else. Yeah, but really, the idea was that we'd have harmonies arranged and guitar parts arranged so that everything was just sort of pinging around the stage so that yeah. people wouldn't know what to kind of focus on um and it was only sort of making the second album and 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 going on from that really that we started arranging proper like block harmonies and and, and sort of singing together rather than singing sort of against each other really do you know what i mean uh, okay yeah yeah oh, 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 oh. you say it's like formed in 2000 so but with the first album, there's obviously 15 songs on there. So is that like four years of songwriting or how did that work? Sort of, yeah. I mean, we did a few sort of, well, we did a handful of singles on another small label that was run okay. by a really nice Irish guy called uh, Darren who ran Fantastic Plastic. And um, he put them out in sort of 2002, 2003. And the, the original idea was that we would make an album on that label as well. They had like Ikara Cult and The Beastings and um, Buff Seeds and a handful of other bands. Right. Signed a deal with them, but before we'd made the album, 679 had come to see us. They were like a subsidiary of Warner Brothers and they basically bought us out of that deal with Darren because that was that was the thing that allowed us to, to go full time. Yeah. And, so sort of start getting paid properly to do it you know so we yeah. had to, we had to take that deal really yeah fair i mean obviously when that album comes out it sounds a love at number eight and the singles yeah. like your album girls gold at that point you're just achieving beyond your dreams kind of thing it's just strange man you know because yeah. i don't think we ever intended for it or expected it at all you know i think you just sort of get on this mad roller coaster and you don't want it to stop because you're enjoying touring the world and playing gigs and thinking about what the next album might sound like and making good pals with other other bands and obviously the the whole sort of reason behind this podcast i suppose is that there was a a great contingent of british guitar bands that yeah were yeah sort of missionaries around the world at, the, at that time you know so it was it was a really exciting thing to be to be part of yeah but so you what, definitely felt part of a community of, of bands at that point I think so, even though I would say that all the ones that spring to my mind all sound very different from each other. You know, I think um, we did that NME tour in 2005 with Block Party and Kaiser Chiefs and The Killers. Oh, yeah. I you know The Killers aren't, aren't English, but every band has a different sound and we're sort of drawing from different 
different things, bringing something a bit different to the table. We had great tours with Franz Ferdinand and the Zootons, the Coral, um, Dogs Die in Hot Cars. Okay. All these bands were like really regionally specific and doing something, to my mind, really quite different from from the next. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, like, I, th I think that that was something that an American audience in particular, I think, really enjoyed. You know, I think that that little scene of English bands going over to America in the mid two thousands was the first time that like Britain had properly managed to go over there and and, and make an impression for for donkeys' years, really. You know? Yeah, yeah. Do you think that kind of made it unique that time for for British guitar bands, especially? <laughs> Well, I think it cha it changed something because I, I remember when we started, um, you you wouldn't hear an accent on the radio, you wouldn't hear um, anything that wasn't sort of this weird kind of sub-American transatlantic drawl, really. You know, I think indie rock was British indie rock at that time was so boring to us that it, it was quite strange that only two or three years later it had sort of been completely. Re reborn in a sense you yeah know? yeah um, but i but I, I i don't think that it's stopped there you know I, I i think that every sort of two or three years since there's been a, a wave of really interesting british british bands you know I, I don't think it was just a moment in time i just think it maybe changed the landscape a little bit i've got to ask you about hounds of love because obviously it's not the most obvious cover and again it's probably <laughs> a question you've been asked quite a few times but what inspired that? What inspired that cover? And obviously it went on to have massive success as well. Well, I mean, it, again, it was just one of these things that you didn't think about too much. We, we, uh, Jaff had put it on a mixtape that we'd had in, in the van when we were on tour. Right. And, um, she was an artist that we all really agreed on and loved. You know, we, did, we don't always agree on all the sort of music that we like. Um, so it was a little bit of a sweet spot, I seem to remember. And just at that time, there was no notion at all that Kate Bush would ever tour again or even yeah. make another album, you know? So to us, the best that we could do in order to kind of like, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily kind of like tip our hat to the song or anything, but the, thing, the only thing that we could do to get that song out to an audience was do a version of, that, of it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it was a good bit of fun, really, you know? It, we, we, <laughs> We just messed around with a few vocal ideas to kind of give it a an identity of ours um, because we knew we couldn't do it just straight up. It wouldn't make sense. Um, but obviously something about it sort of connected with the audience because I think we've played it more or less every gig we've ever done yeah. since, we, since we started doing it. You know, it's become a really important song for us. Like, Yeah, yeah. I remember like going to watch it around that time at um, One Big Weekend. Oh yeah, and um, yeah, like loved all the um, got massive crowd interaction for that song, haven't you? Which 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 one was that in? Um... Uh, so it was in Sunderland that one. Oh yeah, yeah, in yeah. Two, oh, yeah. I mean that was that was amazing. That man, the idea that Radio One would bring a huge festival like that to Sunderland was just yeah. bonkers at the time. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it happened brilliant. to Hull a few years ago, and it was just like, like yeah, wow. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. I mean, Hull had a bit of a. A kind of um, reinvention with the city of culture and everything, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we got quite lucky with stuff like that. Aye. But, um, yeah, was that something that you kind of focused on was getting the crowd involved with the harmonies and stuff like that? I just think we sort of, from the minute that we started playing live, I think one of the most enjoyable things was having a bit of, like, rapport with the crowd, you know, like, not wanting every single gig to be the same. Um all the bands that we'd sort of grown up really admiring and respecting, like a, a particularly like a band, say like Fugazi, for instance, th th there's always a sort of, it's like a contract with the audience, you know, like we're all here for the same reasons. Um, what are the conditions that we can set to make this the best night possible? And just having a bit of crack with the audience and letting them know that it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to be a good night out, isn't it? That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just trying to treat it like that um, in the beginning. Yeah. And so audience stuff like that, you can't even help it if it starts, you know, and I think you've just got to go with it. And I think we tried to cultivate it a little bit with Hounds of Love. Part of the podcast that I think is quite interesting is seeing how 
bands change their recording process? And obviously, you guys moved on to your own label quite early, really. Yeah, so we'd we'd made we'd made two records with the Warner Brothers, and it came in. A, it, this was in around sort of two thousand and late, late two thousand and six, I think it was. The time came for us to um, take up our third option with with six seven nine. Yeah, and basically the the music industry landscape had sort of changed it was unrecognizable between putting out that first record and looking to make a start on our third. Okay. Um, you know, you, YouTube was all of a sudden a thing. Facebook now existed. Yeah. Uh, Napster had happened and streaming and illegal downloading and the kind of perceived collapse of the music industry was something that people were talking about all of a sudden. Right. Yeah. And as a result, I think Warner brothers basically had to, cut the budgets of a lot of their subsidiary labels, 679 being one of them. Mm. Um, and so they were looking to renegotiate our deal, basically. And it was, you know, well within their rights. Second album had sold less than the first. Um, and obviously, they had, to, they had to drop some artists. They had to kind of renegotiate some deals. But we were managed by a guy called Jazz Summers at the time, who's sadly passed away since. But he was a really kind of monumental music industry figure who was really quite forward thinking and he was dead set on us retaining the copyright to any future music that we should make he was okay. sort of, he was certain that the future of the music business would lie in artists retaining their rights and, and looking at a new model for releasing music so we were sort of persuaded i suppose not that it really took much effort but persuaded into the idea of setting up our own label instead. So we said thanks, but no thanks to the offer that 679 made us. Yeah. And um, we went into partnership with our two managers and set up Null Records and we released the next sort of handful of albums on on that imprint. Yeah, okay. And um, I mean, was that difficult? Like how, how obviously the record company before will have handled all the press and everything. Yeah, or, I mean, obviously, it was still a big band at that point, but uh, was it was a bit more hands-on. Well, it was. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, I, th I suppose because we we'd come from a scene where there were a lot of people that we knew, good friends of ours, that ran their own little indie labels, and you know, we knew what the sort of process was. Um, it was. It wasn't as difficult as it perhaps could have been for for for, for some artists. Yeah, but, true. but obviously, we had. Our management in with us as well. Um, yeah. We we had we we still had like a, a a decent budget behind things. It meant that we could still work with it, nothing suffered in terms of working with like radio pluggers and designers and you know a, a label manager and all that sort of stuff. So really, in in a sense, nothing changed other than the the, the kind of the the team got. Uh, slightly smaller but also closer to us in the sense that we knew them all much better than we yeah. did at Warner Brothers. Um, it had sort of pros and cons really. Um, I don't I don't think we would change it because I don't think, I, I, I just don't think there would have been any point in putting another album out with 679 at that time because the, they were getting squeezed for all they were worth by, by Warners. Yeah, yeah. And it would have just been a bit of an unhappy, unhappy marriage, really. So I, th I think we did the right thing, and, I, and I'm and I'm really glad that we did. And and to be fair, like a couple of years later, quite a lot of other bands did the same thing, you know, like Block Party and the Cribs, and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a lot of other a lot of other bands, basically. At the time, did you felt you kind of the first to do it, really? No, no, you know what, man, it didn't feel like that. I think we were oh, just okay. sort of. We were just sort of doing what we felt like we needed to do. Yeah, sure, yeah. To to you know. It, that, that second album was was quite strange because artistically, I think we felt like it was leaps and bounds on from the first one. Right. We did, we did everything on that second one that we didn't do on the first one. Okay. I think we learned a bit of an important lesson in that sometimes the, the audience just wants more of the same rather than something completely different. So it was a real learning curve for us in terms of as art, like as artists, how how you do that. Maybe we maybe we made too much of a of a leap stylistically on that second record, and mm. so the idea of even just getting the chance to make a third album 
at, at that time was actually something that we were quite sort of grateful for in a sense. I was talking to Dan from Black Wire and he oh, yeah. he said they noticed like well he noticed a big shift in like guitar bands becoming a bit uncool like in mm-hmm. between uh, from like 2008 maybe or yeah. onwards. Did you feel that at all or um, did you concentrate on what you were doing? Well I mean it's strange really you know we ended up doing tours with bands that maybe two or three years before we would probably never have ended up touring with you know like we did this MTV package tour with CSS and MGMT uh, yeah, yeah. Um, which was quite a strange sort of set of bands to go on to go on the road together and obviously you know that kind of like um house influence was becoming more apparent in in the like indie artists and stuff yeah but it, but what's strange is that for years we'd had sort of remixes done and we'd worked with people like digitalism and switch and um you know like uh, errol alcan and all these people so i felt like maybe there was a little bit of smooth in the waters for a band like us between those two those two worlds yeah um you know we'd had like songs on mix mag cds and stuff like that quite bizarrely right so it wasn't it wasn't even though it seems like it was really out of step there was a bit of a sort of a connection there yeah but i just I, I i just think for us we actually ended up morphing into a bit more of a of a rock band anyway you know in that third and fourth record i think we were quite interested in sort of distorted guitars and sort of um power and yeah and and, and sort of a little bit more aggression than, than was perhaps present on those first two records so i think we we also just took a little bit of a, of a different turn as well so like looking back at that period uh the like the early period is there a particular high point i mean there seems to be a lot of high points really i I don't know about a particular like individual high point. I just think yeah. just just being able to to tour the world, having come from this very very small scene in Sunderland, you know, playing like the basement function rooms of a cricket club or like the, <laughs> the upstairs room of the sixty capacity pub, to all of a sudden being in Australia or Japan or somewhere like that, and it just I I, I know that that feeling happens. To, to a lot of bands but it, it really is strange and it, it is special and, yeah and so so i think that, that I, 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 in a way even though we've had some time off before we came back with that record last year i still feel like we're in that high point in a sense because we're, we're four mates who are still making music for a living do you know what i mean i think that you can't look a gift horse in the mouth can you no definitely yeah again looking back to the uh i mean it sounds like you've you know, you've done, you've done obviously very well, but uh, is there anything you would change about that early early time or not really? I don't know if there's anything I'd necessarily change. I just think that, like, I always say that, like, finishing that second album was probably the last point we ever felt, like, invincible as, oh, okay. song, as songwriters and artists because we'd never had, we'd never had a knock, you know, we'd never had a bad review, really, you know, there'd never been any sort of criticism or anything. And I think sort of dealing with, you know that second record was was mixed in terms of how people received it okay and and that like was <laughs> a really difficult thing to have to deal with at the time because we weren't expecting it and yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean I, I i as it happens i probably wouldn't change it in a sense because it's it's what makes you it's it's, it's what informs everything else that we've ever done since okay um, and it's in what it's, way I think just that um, you can't think about you can't think about the audience. You yeah, can't, yeah. You, you, but at the same time, you also can't take them for granted. You can't yeah. expect you can't expect everything to supersede the the last. Um, and so I think for us now, whether it's making Future Ed's records or it's doing anything else that we do in our lives, I think it it you've got to just meet it on its own terms and put something into the world and not really have any expectations about. Yeah, yeah. You do hear people, um, well, all different kinds of artists saying you've just got to make make something that you're happy with and try not to worry too much about the audience. But is that, was that quite hard when you get in those mixed reviews? Oh, it's really, it's really challenging. It's extremely difficult because we're not in an era like the 1970s where artists could take creative risks and fail 
Yeah. You know, like um, we couldn't make a metal machine music. <laughs> we couldn't, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we couldn't, it, it, you, you, you couldn't see any band being allowed that level of creative autonomy and still be supported in the future. You know, yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's a difficult fact to come to terms with actually. And I do think it's at the detriment of the music world as it happens, okay. I think you lose a lot of artists, a lot of really, really good artists through um, their work not being sort of deemed commercial enough for a, a commodity. Right. Um, and I think that's why popular music, especially now more than ever, is as bland as it is because risk taking is at an absolute all time low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, yeah, Dan from Black White was saying he knew plenty of his mates were in bands who were signed but then the record did end up getting shelved and never released for whatever oh reason. yeah you hear about that all the time i mean we've got we've we've similarly got some mates who that happened to and even you know they've tried to buy the record back and do it themselves and it just it, it just kills it all it kills the creativity and it just kills any sort of um, momentum or ambition that those artists probably have so yeah aye, it, it, it's difficult man you know and, and hats off to anyone um who can still sort of keep keep going after five ten fifteen years yeah yeah if we like skip ahead i was quite interested with the acapella album what inspired that obviously being from hull uh big fan oh, yeah. of house martins and caravan of love <laughs> yeah but, um yeah i just wondered what inspired that move well i just think because we'd always sang in four-part harmony yeah um, we always used to like hearing the, the mix down in the studio without the without the backline in it, you know, and, and just sort of making sure that we're in tune, that the harmonies were interesting, um, and trying with each album to sort of progress what we could do without with our voices. You know, oh, okay. I, I wouldn't say that we were uh, like choristers or anything by any means. You know, <laughs> we're not we're not a traditional or typical a cappella group by any shakes of the stick, but when it when it came to thinking about doing another record after the chaos i think we were just a bit burnt out and i, th I think if we hadn't made the a cappella album we probably just wouldn't have made an album for a long time because uh, okay. we 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 weren't really in in the mood to to keep the kind of cycle going yeah. but that that a cappella record was revitalizing for us in a way man you know because it allowed us to do totally different things try something out that was very different for us and we were able to tour it in a way that that we'd never been able to tour before you know and you know Jaff brought the, the cello that he hadn't played since he was a kid and you know we had like banjos and mandolins and piano and all these other bits on tour with us we'd do some acapella and some acoustic and it just it just felt felt good man it felt nice to sort of do something different for a while it yeah, still still be powerful because it was the four of us still belting it out, you know. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, no, it was it was really important aspect of the band that obviously got to touch on when you kind of when you just had a bit of a hiatus with the band, or was it? Did you think it was probably ended at that point? In was it twenty fifteen? Uh, yeah, was, I think it was about twenty thirteen when we knocked uh, it on right, the head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like it, it, it has been written about and Barry's spoken about this quite a bit, but it, it, he was just in such a poor um, sort of state of, of mental health that we, we we couldn't, we couldn't tour, we couldn't make records even if we'd wanted to, you know. It, uh, was, fair enough, right. it was just untenable at the time. So I'm really glad and grateful that a few years ago when we sort of started talking about doing something again that, that, that he was in a position to be really energized and up for it and and he's managed to get through everything that he's been through because he's had a really difficult time and obviously you know more and more musicians are starting to talk about this stuff yeah. now yeah but it but it can it, it it can be a really exhausting cycle of um a really exhausting creative cycle but also your integrity is being challenged every day by yeah. um, public perception, uh, the crit critics, your, your own ego, 
every, <laughs> everything, man, you know, so it, 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 I, it's a fantastic way to make a living, don't get me wrong, but it, is, it isn't without its challenges, like. No, definitely. I mean, you've been doing it, what, 20 years now? Mm. <laughs> you know, you're up and down. Somehow. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. But, you know, the, the main thing is for us that we're all still really close. We speak pretty much every day, at least on, on uh, texts or whatever. Yeah. And, um, I was still, we still enjoy being in each other's company and not many people can say that after 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. With that in mind, you must be buzzing when you got your last album out. Yeah, no, I mean, it was just... It, well, for a few reasons, really, but the main one was that for a good time there, I didn't think it was a record we'd ever be able to make. Yeah. Um, it just looked like it wasn't going to happen. But right. I don't know, like thinking about that now is strange because we're so happy about being back on the road. We, we enjoy touring so much and we're, we're looking forward to making the next record whenever the sort of circumstances allow us to get together. Like, but, yeah, I was um, going to say but yeah, yeah, it, it, it really feels like the old days and it kind of feels in some respects like that little sort of five, six year period where we weren't doing anything. It's like it, it didn't happen, strangely, now. Yeah. I mean, were you still active with uh, with music in that time? Yeah, I was, yeah. So I was doing a few things, really. I, I, I joined another band from Sunderland called Frankie and the Heartstrings. Oh, uh, yeah. And we made a record in 2015 together. Um and, and I've done sort of uh, songwriting and, and music direction for a few sort of theatre projects and things, um, which I've really enjoyed doing. And it's it, it sort of opened up a whole different sort of wor world to us as a musician. Yeah, okay. So, what, like um, doing theatre scores and stuff? Yeah, yeah, and, cool. and, and writing songs for, for, for shows. Oh, um, nice one. Which, is, yeah, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it, but... It, it's good to have that on the go alongside doing the future heads, you know, it, it, it doesn't quite feel right if we're not also doing the band. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I also saw you've been doing um, a bit of graphic design work. Yeah. So, I mean, basically when we were touring in America in particular, we'd be going around all these different venues and seeing these really beautiful, cool silkscreen printed posters, you know, that were always done by a, a local artist in the area. And that were all always sort of signed at the end of the night and stuff. And I, I, I sort of really got into that and researched that and, and, and sort of understood the sort of um, the, the, the history of that as a medium and, and sort of started designing my own posters when I'd sort of got home from one American tour one time and we had a little bit of spare time on our hands. I sort of um, started to learn the basics of screen printing using a sort of local studio in Newcastle. And uh, after a little while of kind of uh, trial and error and sort of pulling it together, um, I, I, I really sort of got into it and started doing it a lot around, around the doors here, you know, doing uh, little posters for local bands and making my own prints and things like that. Yeah. Um, and just, uh, just it sort of snowballed from there is something to do in my own downtime, really. Okay. And then I was reading that you, um, you even produced the artwork for the BBC Six Music Festival. I mean, that sounds like a massive project. Yeah, I mean, uh, when they brought the festival to Tyneside, I just got a phone call out of the blue one day by someone saying, um, we, we, we've seen your work, we like your work, and it's, it's nice that it would be a, a sort of artist from a band that would sort of otherwise be playing the festival, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think we, we were in that period of, of inactivity at that point. So yeah, I, I jumped at the chance to have a go at doing it because um, I hadn't really did, sort of designed too much for like, Co corporate clients or like official people at that point you know I was just sort of entertaining myself really making my own work and just sort of having that tick over yeah. so that was that was very very cool and a little bit a little bit different to do the yeah. artwork for the festival um but it, it, I think you need those things to come along sometimes you know it sort of it kicked me along in my own sort of practice and I'd so, certainly improved off the back of having to sort of um follow a brief and resize things and do all that like sort of everyday kind of um dry kind of stuff that, that, the, that the clients kind of requesting from you you know what i mean yeah yeah and did you find it was um more stressful than actually playing the festival <laughs> <laughs> yeah without a doubt mate yeah i mean <laughs> I, I think it's one thing to sort of just um beaver away doing these things for your own amusement 
you know, it's, it's just like I, you know, I like going out and taking photographs and this, that and the other. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot of people who are who either in bands or they do something creative, it, it, they don't just stick stick to their own lane sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? You like to try and, try and do a few things outside yeah. of that as well. And I think for me, it was just, I started getting asked to do things off the back of that that, that, I, that I wouldn't have ever ex- expected to do, you know, and I've ended up working with quite a lot of venues and things, especially in the Northeast. Right, yeah. And I guess that kind of work would be quite useful at the minute in lockdown. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I still try and sort of treat the, the music and the songwriting as the, as the sort of main, main thing that I do. Um, I haven't sort of, um, I'm in a fortunate position of ha- not having to kind of go out looking for looking for stuff to occupy my time, you know, I've got quite a few yeah. things that are on the on the boil at the moment that are keeping me nice and busy in terms yeah, of enough, yeah. songwriting projects and stuff. And I'm also conscious that like, you know, f- f- for me, the design stuff just came out of uh, wanting to have a little bit of fun myself, do you know what I mean? It's not, I, I, I think it would be a bit, a bit much if I was to try and sort of make a, a career or a living out of it. I think I just do it for fun, really. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it is nice to do that sort of stuff every now and again when the right people come along. Still making music now. How has the process of making music changed? Has it changed much, much at all for you guys? Yeah, no, no, really, we, we still do it like we used to do it, man. You know, we just um, we sort of come up with a few individual ideas ourselves independently, and then we get together in the rehearsal room and we just thrash through them and, and make sense of them and put them together and, and, and write as a, as a four-piece, you know? Um, okay. A lot of extra stuff gets added in the studio. We've made our last few records up here in, in Newcastle, which is great because everyone in the band apart from me has got, got kids, so there's a lot of other things going on there. Yeah. And, uh, no, we've just found a way of making it work for us that's sort of manageable, that, that everyone enjoys. Um, if it was up to me, we'd probably tour a lot more. I okay. guess at the same time, you've, you've got to understand that like you know i'm 37 now there's sort of um there's different sort of um priorities and preoccupations <laughs> in people's lives than when we were 18 year old so yeah yeah, yeah it, it, it's it, it's good man you touched on it before with the internet and stuff um but how would you see it for new bands now like how would you see it for you guys if you were starting now would it be a lot more challenging do you think with the internet yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I do think about this quite a lot and just, just think like, well, I wouldn't have a clue where to start now because it was so organic and so grassroots and so kind of like um, blind, if you like, the way, yeah. that it, the way that it happened for us that I'm not sure that that's really, really possible now because there's, there's no hiding place. You've got to be present everywhere. You've got to be really active on social media on instagram and you know you've got to be pumping out material yeah all of the time and and and, you know i think about some of the personalities of the lads in in our band and it's much more like 1960s than it is 2020s like (laughs) (laughs) you know it's it's not like um there's a there's a sort of egotism if you like and, yeah, and, and, yeah. It's, and it's an enforced egotism you know everyone's sort of cajoled into playing this game of just pumping out material and taking photographers on tour to like post a, an image online every yeah, six yeah. hours or something and it's just a little bit exhausting I, f- I would have, i would find it a little bit exhausting if i was a, a young artist coming through yeah um yeah because i guess the problem must be monetizing it as well like Mm-hmm. Obviously, when you guys are starting, you got a bit of um, a bit of encouragement with with labels and stuff with the yeah. money. I guess now it must be a lot harder to start earning money. I assume. Yeah, I mean, we we sort of started in an era where you could still sell records, um, and obviously, it's it's a totally different different cap of fish now. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, I suppose it's all about live income, isn't it? It's all about touring and merch. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I mean, any, anyone who can make a living off streaming is doing doing pretty well for themselves. So they don't they don't need my help. But then, if you're a young artist coming through, you've still really just got to play. You've got to perform as, as much as you possibly can, and just hope that you get the breaks. Yeah, yeah. 
Do you think you're all at, a rage now, at an age now where you all appreciate it a bit more, do you think? I think so, in a sense, yeah, because I think you kind of, you, you can't spare as much time. So, like, any tour that we do or any festival that we play, we've had to really seriously consider whether we've actually wanted to do it or not as a, oh, okay. as a group, you know. And so that means that the stuff we do do, we we enjoy more, I guess, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, th I think we I think we are making more of it now than we than we maybe did years ago. The last question I put in was it whether you got. <laughs> I said funny Lee and Gallagher story, but I appreciate not everyone has one. No, you know what? Well, we played with them in um, Hamden in Glasgow, and it was an absolutely amazing gig. Um, and he was he was lovely. He, we, we didn't see a great deal of him, but he, he made a great effort to come and uh, welcome us. And it was Super Fairy Animals who, who was, were also on the bill. Yeah. And, uh, and when we hung out for a little while, he was really, like, he was a proper sweetheart of a bloke, actually. And Noel, we sort of ran into quite a few times over the years because we did a tour with the Zootons and he was really into the Zootons. So okay. he, he came to quite a few of those dates. But then because Gem, who was in the band at the time, was from the northeast. There was a, a good bit of crack on about that. He just thought we were mad, though. I, 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 <laughs> I don't think he could ever really get his head around what, what it was that we were doing, you know? Like, uh, he just used to always call us, like, mental. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I've got to say, like, lovely, lovely fellas and nothing nothing but good experiences of hanging out with them. I mean, we've, uh, we've got our own version of the Gallagher brothers in in the future heads, you know, like Barry and Dave <laughs> fight as badly as any other brothers I've ever known. Like, oh, so. really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just quick one, like, your favourite bands are your or underrated bands from the, like, 01 to 08 era, do you think? Anyone that stands out? Oh, yeah, yeah. Quite a few. So uh, Donna from Elastica had this great band called Clang, K-L-A-N-G, and we played with them quite a bit in the very early days, and they were great, really good. But I don't, okay. know if they, I don't know if they ever played outside of London. Um, I used to love that band Claw. Uh, yeah. They were brilliant. Um, and I still think about that. Um, I mentioned them earlier on, but I still think about that Dogs Die in Hot Cars first record, <laughs> man. You know, that's got some really, really great tunes on it. Like, <laughs> I was weirdly thinking about that song the other day because uh, I had the dog in the car. And that, that, that song immediately comes in your head, doesn't it? That, I love you, I love you. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know, they, they, were, they were great. Like, and I don't think they had uh, any sort of idea about all of those bands that they sounded like. You know, I, I, I don't even think they'd heard of Talking Heads or television or anything like that. You know, I just think it was, it was an accident. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got gigs scheduled, haven't you? But obviously, you'll, you'll be waiting. I mean, I've just seen you've been rescheduling them. We've put a few back in for September, but I, th I suppose we're under no illusions that they might have to get pulled again. And um, pretty much every festival we were booked to play is just rescheduled for next year. So uh, it's, a, it's a shame, but, you know, there might be some new tunes that we can play at least next time. So yeah, some, yeah. something to look forward to. Yeah, have you got um, a new album on the way kind of thing? We, we, you know what we've just we've been talking about doing some some new music and we've all got sort of ideas to put in the mix but we've not really had a chance to get in the rehearsal room and start working on a new record as it as it were um, okay. we did a few of those a cappella type shows around uh, christmas just for something different to do all right but yeah new music's the next thing for us like definitely um one final one are you happy with social <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely am, mate. Yeah, I really, I really am. I mean, um, I think what was sort of looking a little bit dodgy for for a while is whether he'd be given the time or not. But yeah, it, it looks like they're, they're definitely backing him. Yeah, it's starting to pay off on it before all this happened. Uh, absolutely, mate. Yeah, um, I mean, I used to go with my dad, and now I now go to Old Trafford on my own. I've got a season ticket, and I just drive oh, really? on my own. Yeah, um, oh, nice one. Um, and the you can even feel the atmosphere in the crowd starting to starting to change again and going back to that you know you know for about are you a united fan fella no i mean i'm i'm whole oh Hull, yeah, yeah right, okay. but, um, i did, I did go to on, the yeah. um when i first moved up here i, tra I trapped myself to united liverpool tickets i did go this season yeah 
Oh, all right, yeah. What, for the, the draw? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was sat in um, the corner of the Stratford end, I think, so. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I just think that under Moyes and Van Gaal and Mourinho, there's been a slight kind of edge in, in the crowd that's sort of like it can just turn at any time all, all too quickly. Um, the great thing about the, the years under Ferguson was that it didn't matter if you went one or two down, there was always this sort of like attitude in the, in the crowd that, that the team would be able to pull it, pull it back round. Yeah. You, you need that. I think that's what Liverpool have got at the moment is a sort of a confidence and an arrogance in the crowd. And you, yeah. You, you sort of need it, I think. And it's, it's, it's coming back, I think. I feel like it is anyway. What's the ideal outcome for the season for you is if it gets cancelled? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got to say, there'd be, there'd be something really quite beautiful about that. Like, wouldn't it? <laughs> it is mental, isn't it? Like, the one season they're going to do it. I know, like... I know. I know. I've got quite a few mates who are, who are Scousers who are big Liverpool supporters and they're obviously desperate for that to not happen. And in a way, I mean, they have been the, they have been the, best, the best side in the division, but it would be absolutely marvellous. If, if, if they just decided to make it null and void. 